And thank you for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, migrant crossings are at record numbers at the U.S.-Mexico border. Now, several border state governors are doing what they can to protest President Joe Biden's immigration policies. We'll take a look at what they're doing and why some don't agree with them. A federal judge has ordered the Justice Department to provide redacted versions of the affidavit used to search former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. The judge saying he is not prepared to find the affidavit should be fully sealed. He understands that the public is going to likely be entitled to some parts of this warrant application and its affidavit. We'll show you new cutting edge technology that extracts the greatest benefits from plants. We call the technology uh, uh, bioplant solicitation. And this technology helps us to grow cells in liquid media to mimic the nature. Then later. We sit down with award-winning recording artist Ann Wilson as she talks about the tragedy that changed the course of her life. All these stories and more are coming up next from the CBN Newsroom. This is CBN Newswatch. We begin this half hour with arrest at the U.S.-Mexico border, having the country on pace to shatter previous apprehen apprehension numbers. Migrant crossings are happening while border state governors continue to tell the president's administration to do something about the crisis. CBN News, Washington correspondent Matt Galka has our top story. From buses to shipping containers, the governors of Texas and Arizona are using whatever they can to solve immigration problems in their states and to protest Joe Biden's immigration policies. This as the U.S. is on pace to top two million border arrests for the first time ever. Tractor trailers move shipping containers into position in Yuma, Arizona, as the state looked to fill a 1,000-foot gap in the border wall. The containers will be topped with razor wire. With Arizona Governor Doug Ducey tweeting last week, Arizona has had enough. We can't wait any longer. Texas Governor Greg Abbott is also feuding with the Biden administration. Both Ducey and Abbott have bused migrants from their states to Washington, D.C. and New York City. Abbott doubled down on the move at the CPAC conference earlier this month. There are more buses on the way as we gather at this conference today. The move enraged New York City Mayor Eric Adams, who called the busing of asylum seekers horrific. It's unimaginable uh, that what uh, the governor of Texas has done, when you think about this country, a country that has always been open uh, to those who were fleeing uh, persecution and other uh, un 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 intolerable conditions. And this video from Texas highlights the state's feud with the president's border policies. The Texas National Guard had locked a gate at a crossing area. Border Patrol unlocked it to process migrants trying to get into the country. Abbott called it unbelievable. Border Patrol agents have made more than 1.8 million arrests this fiscal year. The number beats last year's record with two months to go. About 70 percent of the stops are single adults likely looking for work. The numbers come as the Biden administration has undone or rolled back some of the Trump-era immigration policies. The Remain in Mexico policy requiring asylum seekers to stay in Mexico until their court hearings is over. Title 42, a policy that denies migrants asylum because of the pandemic, remains in effect. The administration wants to end the program. They announced that back in April, uh, but a court has ordered that they keep it in place. So the administration uh, complies in a minimal fashion, uh, but they're not interested in, in such enforcement tools. Analysts believe that the numbers are partially and maybe surprisingly driven by Title 42, even though the policy is meant to turn people away at the border. Title 42 does not penalize people for repeated crossings. Border Patrol estimates that about one in four people have tried to enter the U.S. repeatedly over the past year. Matt Gelka, CBN News. Federal Judge Bruce Reinhardt has ordered the Justice Department to bring forth proposed redactions of the probable cause affidavit used to search former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. Right now, the Justice Department wants the affidavit to remain secret, saying publicly releasing the sensitive documents at this point could jeopardize the criminal investigation. But the magistrate judge, who approved the FBI search warrant, says he's leaning towards the public seeing the DOJ's written justifications for the unprecedented move. This comes more than a week 
week after the FBI seized classified and top secret information during the search of the former president's home. If the affidavit is released, it would shed some light on the criminal investigation that led to the search. Prosecutors have a week to submit copies of the redacted documents. In other news, Boston Children's Hospital is under fire after a now-deleted video promoting gender-affirming hyst hysterectomies for young girls posted to the website. Joining us with more on this now is FaithWire.com's Trey Goins Phillips. So, Trey, the promotional ad in question has since been removed from the hospital's website, but the doctor featured on the ad still has the video posted to our own personal Twitter account. Can you tell us a little bit more about this and what this ad entails? So uh, Dr. Frances Grimstad, she's a gynecologist with uh, BCH, Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, she describes herself on her personal Twitter account, as you mentioned, as, quote, a trans reproductive advocate. Uh, and the video that, that we're talking about today uh, described, quote, gender affirming hysterectomies. Now, there were some questions early on about how young uh, would they perform these kinds of hysterectomies on children who had gender dysphoria or who self-identified as transgender. Uh, and the hospital didn't make clear exactly how young, but then they issued a statement later uh, saying that 17 and 18 uh, would be the youngest that they would perform this procedure, 17 with parental approval and 18 obviously uh, as an adult. Uh, but of course, the, the main concern is even for a 17-year-old, this is a huge decision, uh, and it would, of course, render these females incapable uh, of of reproducing or or having children uh, later in their life should they should they choose to have it or later even find out, wait, I, I don't have gender dysphoria or I wish I hadn't chosen uh, to transition my identity. Now, the ad apparently is part of a bigger series of transgender surgeries for young men and women. Can you tell us more about this? So there's a whole host of videos that started being posted by BCH uh, roughly a, a year ago uh, this month uh, in August, I believe, of, of last year. They started uploading on their YouTube account a series of videos addressing all kinds of issues, all centered on the transgender debate. One of the videos uh, featured a psychologist from BCH arguing that even some arbitrary behavior, uh, such as a, a child refusing to sit down for a haircut uh, or playing with uh, their opposite sex siblings' toys, things that children do all the time, things that I remember I did as a child, uh, you know, the, these are behaviors that a kid could Thanks, exhibit man. for any number of reasons. Uh, but this psychologist argued that that could be indicative of actually a transgender identity, which which is, of course, concerning. And then another doctor uh, said that children can know, quote, from the womb uh, that they're transgender. Yes. Uh, of course, this doctor failed to explain how they could even understand that. Yeah. Going to have to leave you there. Thank you so much. Trey Goins, Phyllis with FaithWire.com. Want to turn now overseas to a controversy involving Israel. Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas is walking back comments he made about the Holocaust. In a recent visit to Germany, Abbas was asked about the Palestinian attack on the Jewish athletes at the Munich Games 50 years ago. His reply set off a firestorm in Germany and Israel. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl is on this story. Abbas came to Germany on a state visit to talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The two leaders agreed to work towards a peaceful solution in the Middle East. Afterward, a reporter asked the Palestinian Authority chairman if he would apologize to Israel and Germany ahead of the 50th anniversary of the Munich Olympics massacre. During the 1972 Summer Games, Palestinian terrorists took Israeli athletes and coaches hostage, murdering 11 of them and a German policeman. Abbas's answer led to outrage in Germany, Israel and beyond. Since 1947 and until today, Israel has committed 50 massacres in 50 Palestinian villages. 50 massacres. 50 Holocaust, and until now, every day. They were dead at the hands of the Israeli army. We are saying enough of this. Come to peace. Israeli Prime Minister Yair Lapid called the comments a monstrous lie, tweeting, six million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust, including one and a half million Jewish children. History will never forgive him. Defense Minister Benny Gantz, who met with Abbas recently over security issues, called his words despicable and false. The reprehensible and unfounded comparison between the Holocaust and the IDF is Holocaust denial. 
Those who seek peace are expected to acknowledge the past and not to distort reality and rewrite history. Abbas later partially walked back his comments in a statement, saying he had no intention of denying the Holocaust and calling it the most heinous crime in modern human history. Ephraim Zuroff, director of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, says people should not have been surprised. Abu Mazen, after all, wrote a doctorate about Holocaust denial. While Chancellor Scholz took flack for not immediately denouncing the remarks, he later tweeted in German and English, I am disgusted by the outrageous remarks made by Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. For us Germans in particular, any relativization of the singularity of the Holocaust is intolerable and unacceptable. I condemn any attempt to deny the crimes of the Holocaust. Across the whole political spectrum in Germany, there was outrage, justifiably outrage. I mean, to say a thing like that in the chancellery, in Berlin, where all this began, I mean, this is just unbelievable. Despite the momentary outrage, Zuroff concedes business will likely go on as usual. And the question is, what price will Abu Mazen pay? And, and I'm afraid he won't pay any price whatsoever. The EU will continue to send him millions of dollars. He'll continue to pay his terrorists. And it's as if nothing happened. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. An Israeli company is using cutting-edge technology to extract the greatest benefits from plants and put them in pill form. It's a breakthrough that could lead to healthier lives. Chris Mitchell has that story from Jerusalem. God gave us 500,000 plants that all themselves carried critical, active, medicinal compounds that are so important for the human body. And by trying to scientifically get the best of what plants offer, BioHarvest Sciences CEO Ilan Sobel says his company has reached an amazing breakthrough. We at BioHarvest Sciences have developed a platform technology that's able to take any essential, active, medicinal compound from the plant. And we grow these compounds in cells in a way we are able to maintain the original structural composition of these specific medicinal compounds. Using a process shrouded in secrecy, the cells are developed in bioreactors for three weeks and then harvested. We call the technology uh, uh, bioplant solicitation. And this technology helps us to grow cells in liquid media to mimic the nature, to take all the benefits of the nature and to power it, to make it better. We left with an amazingly soluble and bioavailable end product with this unique powder, which ultimately contains all the essential polyphenols from a plant. Food science professor Zohar Karim of the Hebrew University says this technology goes beyond what university labs have accomplished in this area. The technology of bioharvest is uh, revolutionary in the sense that they know today how to take productive organs of a plant, might it be the fruit, the flowers, the leaves, and they can grow these in culture and make them produce the expected amount of the compound that they are looking for. And that's not all. The second is the, the upscale from a petri dish or from a little flask at the lab to an industrial production. And their technology allows to do the upscaling rapidly and in a safe way. I've analyzed their products and, and they, they are what they say they are. The first product, Vinia, is made from skin, flesh, and seed cells of the red grape. Scientists got the idea from what's called the French paradox. French people, they generally have a very fatty diet. Lots of pate, lots of liver, lots of cheeses, but they have very good cardiovascular health. And the scientists realized it was from moderate consumption of red wine. They realized it was from a combination of polyphenols from the red grape. There's one king polyphenol called Pisceid resveratrol. Each capsule of vinia in this jar contains the same amount of Pisceid resveratrol as a full bottle of red wine, or 1,000 grapes, but without the sugar, the alcohol, or the calories. Together working with other polyphenols like catagen, coercetine, tannins, and anthocyanins, they work together in order to provide this really excellent cardiovascular health.
Sobel says there are environmental benefits as well. In one year, we're able to produce the equivalent of roughly 250,000 square meters of land. When it comes to water, all of our water is biodegradable. The grape is one of the seven species of the Bible listed in Deuteronomy 8.8. Two other plant products from that list are currently in development, one from olives and another from the pomegranate. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Welcome back to CBN News Watch. Award-winning artist Ann Wilson sat down with Studio 5 to talk about the tragedy that changed the course of her life. You just received two uh, Kayla Fan Awards, yes, correct? Yeah. And the winner of Female Artist of the Year is Ann Wilson. All glory goes to God. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all. Yeah, I did win two, two Kayla Fan Awards. That was insane. <laughs> and the winner of this year's breakout single is Ann Wilson, My Jesus. <laughs> I remember when I wrote My Jesus and just having this moment of realizing that this song was going to impact so many people, and I had no idea that it was going to in the way in which it did, but I'm so grateful. Literally, you were not even thinking of a career in no, singing? No, not at all. Not what, at all. What were you thinking to do? I wanted to be an astronaut and work for NASA. <laughs> <laughs> I just had this, like, really deep love for space, and I wanted to explore God's creation on a whole new level. So um, I was pursuing wanting to be an astronaut and like that was my deepest passion. And then in 2017, five years ago, my, my big brother Jacob passed away in a car accident. He was 23 years old. And that was the moment that changed everything. And I, I realized, I felt like the Lord just, well, I realized that there's such a short life that we live here on earth and the importance of following Jesus and telling people about him and his love. And um, I never wanted someone to have to lose a loved one and know that they didn't go to heaven. And I didn't want, I just, that was such a heavy weight. That was the moment that I, I knew that I was called to music and uh, specifically music for the Lord and his glory. So it's a crazy story how it all turned out. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. So my Jesus, of course, is the breakout. This is where we got to hear Ann Wilson's voice. Mm -hmm. This is where we all fell in love. This song came from. Let me tell you about my Jesus. So right after my brother passed away, I started journaling. I would write down the date and I would write down at the end of each day that God got me through another day. I wanted to prove to myself that I was gonna survive the tragedy. Because there were a lot of days, I'm sure if for those listening, like if you've lost a loved one or you've gone through anything that's just really hard, there's times where you just want to give up completely. And um, there were so many days where I just wanted to give up and go to heaven and be with Jesus and Jacob. And um, But I would find myself that in those moments of, of wanting to give up, um, choosing not to give up was so important. I noticed that I had only referred to the Lord as my Jesus. Like you would never find, thank you God for today, or thank you Lord, whatever it was, thank you my Jesus, or I love you my Jesus. And I just remember um, like having this moment of realizing, why is it that I've only ever written my Jesus? And I felt the Lord speak to me and say, it's because it's the truth and you are mine and I am yours and we have a personal relationship. And I realized that out of a personal relationship with Jesus is what flows everything else. So the album is naturally called My Jesus, yes, right? Yeah. And you could tell me sort of the story behind it and your thoughts on the song yeah. real quick. Sunday Sermons? Yeah, so Sunday Sermons is my current radio single. And I'll start with so I grew up in church my whole life was in, raised in an incredible Christian family. My parents are amazing. I knew the Lord from a young age, knew of Him, um, but I didn't come to know Him until seventh grade where I actually accepted Him as my Lord and Savior. I remember having this moment of realizing that God used every Sunday sermon, every church service to like plant seeds in my life. Sunday sermons was just written as kind of a reminder to people that 
you're planting seeds along the way. Like if you're raising your kids in church, keep doing it because the Lord has a plan for that. He's gonna use that. And um, for me, it was just felt like the right next song and the right next single. And I love kind of the country aspect of it. It's something that we've never done before. No matter what the world throws at me, I know his word is true. It all started with hearts, love, spirit, moves on these So you're singing. Where does actually songwriting then come into this? I don't even know if I've ever shared this, but um, me and my sister actually wrote a song together about just the grief of losing our brother. And I guess that was our first song we'd ever written. Writing was actually something that didn't come easy to me. I feel like most artists that do music, writing's like their favorite thing ever and they're super good at it and passionate at it. But I never really was until just um, over the past couple years. And so that's kind of how it just started slowly, you know, getting developed into the writing scene. And then now it's pretty much all I do and I love it now and it's so fun, but uh, definitely was something that I had to kind of work at and get better at. What was your relationship like with your brother? One thing about Jacob was he had this perspective on people that I've never met anyone else that's ever had this, but um, I'd be having a hard day or some someone would frustrate me and I'd be like, hey, this person did this and that. And he would always say, and we have no idea what they're walking through in their life. Like we're not to judge, we're not to talk bad about people. And I just remember that really impacting me and it still does to this day of, of knowing that to love people like Jesus loves, to be kind to people like he's kind to others. What do you think he would say about what God has done with you and through you right now. I just know within my heart that he would be so proud and excited. And I fully believe that he's in the great cloud of witnesses and that he's able to see everything that's going on. And I know that he's watching over me. A final thought for your Friday, God will use it all. Mistakes, missteps, and mess ups. You need not worry. He will weave them all together for your good and for his glory. With that word, I encourage you to make this a fabulous Friday and be sure to have yourself a wonderful and rest-filled weekend. That is gonna do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. We thank you for watching. I wanna remind you, you can always find more of our programs on the CBN News Channel or at cbnnews.com. We'll see you right back here come Monday. Goodbye and God bless everybody.